Well, welcome to episode seven. We have some information that you're all going to find very interesting and very practical. And it's a follow up on episode six, where we talked about the stress reduced approach that uh, Simone Della Perry uh, first published in 2002. And we wrote some articles, 2009, other articles that we've written. But the stress reduced direct technique is a part of every biomimetic restoration. Whether you construct the whole tooth, as Simone does often, or you take the foundation and stress reduce it for your bio base, the stress reduce direct technique is part of that. Now we're going to talk about the other stress reducing technique in a bio base that is critical besides the composite incremental technique that Simone published. And this is called deep margin elevation. Now, a deep margin elevation is a stress reducing technique. Why is that? It's because these deep areas have to be built up separately from the rest of the missing dentin. And that separate buildup takes time. And so when we have a deep margin elevation, it's taking time, and that time allows the bond to the dentin the time to mature and to time to flow towards the hybrid layer. And that maturation is what we call decoupling with time. So a stress-reducing direct technique for a bio base that includes deep margin elevation, these are protocols that allow us to have the highest bond strength in our dentin replacement. So the articles that we'll be talking about today will be 1998, DDA Dici, Roberto Sprefico, the first published uh, illustration of a deep margin elevation. After that, two other papers from Dici that followed up in his PhD research. And those two papers investigated what kind of materials should be used for the deep margin elevation. And that was published in 2003. Also in 2003, we had a paper that showed that a separation of the deepest part of a class two should be separated by time to have the best results in a class two restoration. So a deep box and a class two restoration are very similar, except one's deep, one's not as deep, but both were shown by Dietschy to have a benefit with these stress-reducing protocols. And then we have independent confirmation from three countries, actually, when they talk about the deep margin elevation, 2012, Pascal Magne and Roberto Sperifico published that article. And then in 2008, 14, a German group did the same long-term in vivo uh, study in vitro and in vivo studies compared. And then in 2019, we had a long-term 12-year study from David Jerdol and his associates in France and in Holland, particularly Marco Gresnik, in following these deep margin elevations long-term. So let's talk about how did I first do my first deep margin elevation? Well, it has the history in that uh, with traditional dentistry, I was doing a lot of root canals. And so with root canals that had been caused from leakage and decay around deep class two restorations, I had the opportunity to learn how to be a better endodontist. And I took advantage of that. And that uh, was from courses given by my class valedictorian at University of Pacific, Steve Buchanan. Steve Buchanan had revolutionized the endodontic world when he started to embrace mechanical rotary instruments, nickel titanium files. And he became a very popular speaker. And I went to many of his lectures uh, at ADA convention and then did a hands-on course uh, with him. And that hands-on course was in 1999. And that was the first time I was introduced to a microscope. And then I bought my microscope at the end of that year. But then in these times when I was becoming a very professional endodontist, I would do my own endo. And then after I had done that, 
then I would restore the tooth. But the situation in endodontics is that you must isolate the tooth to prevent bleach, which is the irrigating solution, from going into the patient's mouth, which is never a good thing if the patient is having the bleach put into their into their oral cavity. So when I'm doing my endo, if I have a deep submarginal defect that I'm trying to isolate, that's a problem. Traditional techniques would say, well, you could go and do a crown lengthening surgery. I knew how to do that and I could do that, but then there's a healing time. But the idea came to me when I was getting ready to do a molar endodontic treatment that if I built up the deep subsidual wall with composite, which I had been, you know, started training uh, two years before with Ray Bertolotti, then I could isolate the tooth with a rubber dam easily, and there would not be a problem with bleach contamination. So I did my first deep margin elevation, 1998, early 1998, and I did it with the chemical cure materials that I had, the chemical cure bonding system, photobond and the dual cure material that was called uh, Beastville 2B, made by Ray Bertolotti from Bisco. And this technique that I used to elevate this margin, once it was bonded, it allowed me to isolate and do my endodontic treatment. But then my endodontic treatment was done, and I'm looking at this bonded box that I had full confidence in, even though in 1998, I didn't have all the details of hierarchy of bondability and dental flow with chemical cure composites that we talked about last episode. But I did know that the C factor was very low. Why? Because I actually could see the bonded surface. It's just the shell of the box bonded on two thin sides of the mesial and buccal and one box depth. But then the unbonded surface of that wall that was being built to isolate the tooth, that had a huge unbonded ratio. It was very, very low. Therefore, the shrinkage of the composite would not stress the bond very much. It would shrink not away from a wall, but towards the center of mass. You know, the I could make an illustration of that. It's a little bit complicated if you haven't been trained in the six lessons, but still, the idea is that I elevated a deep margin, three to four millimeters with chemical cure composite. I used a dual cure bonding system, photo bond, and then once I had that done, it allowed me to do the endo. And then the question was, traditional techniques in 1998. I'm still going between. Crowns, no crowns. Crowns, no crowns. So I felt comfortable in large composites. Obviously, I've been doing crowns successfully for 18 years. But I looked at that restoration, and I'm saying, I'm not going to take that off so that I can create a perfect ferrule. A ferrule, by definition, is two millimeters of sound two structure that is going to give the firm foundation that the crown is going to attach to. But that ferrule was going to be two millimeters subgingival. And so I had to deal with the gingiva, which would be a surgical procedure. Or if I have the bonded deep margin and it's sealed, and I'm not relying on mechanical retention, which a ferrule is part of in a crown retention, but I'm just going to be relying on adhesive. I'm planning in this situation to do a large inlay, actually. And so at that point, I said, look, the rest of my tooth, the bond to dentin has been established. It was actually established uh, 24 hours ago. I'd finished the endo. A patient came back actually the next day. And I had this bonded surface. And I said, I'm just going to add to that surface. So the immediate dentin sealing is in place. There's been no stress on the dentin bond of all of the dentinal surface around the root canal access of the pulp chamber. I didn't etch, but I knew that the composite, the immediate dentin sealing should be cleaned a little bit. And so that surface uh, was rinsed, dried. At that point, I'm not sure if I had air abrasion, 
but I added another layer of adhesive onto my de immediate dent and sealing. And then I looked at my preparation that was immediate dent and sealed, and then the deep margin was elevated in the back. And then I said, well, there's some undercuts here. I can change the geometry by taking out those undercuts by adding composite, bonded composite. So I changed the geometry of the large inlay shape preparation by one, doing the deep margin elevation separately, and then removing any undercuts by an additive technique. And all of a sudden I had a nice smooth and flat on the bottom and smooth on the side inlay preparation that had composite on the gingival floor that had been elevated and then composite on the uh, buccal and lingual walls. And I had now a nice inlay preparation that had draw. And I took that impression and made my inlay, my large inlay, and then cemented it with protocols of a resin cement. And after that was done in 1998, I looked at it and I said, well, I wonder if anybody else in the world is doing this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was determined to find out. So, 1998, I went to the 88 convention and made, had a lunch with Bertolotti and met uh, Gary Unterbrink for the first time and heard John Kank and Charlie Cox, heard the name John Coy. So, I mean, 1998 was that uh, year for me that really got me into a commitment of learning as much as I can about adhesive dentistry. But in 1998, the published book from Dietschy was this book. And I purchased that at the 88 convention, 1998. It did not have deep margin elevation in that book. But I had the opportunity to talk with Gary Unterbrink, talk with Ray Bertolotti. They didn't see any, any problem with having a resin base underneath the composite restoration, just making it larger. But the separation of these two masses of composite, the inlay and the resinous base, to me was now becoming clear that the C factor determination of my deep margin elevation that I had made was the correct one. Again, I didn't have decoupling with time and hierarchy of bondability in 1998 fully in my mind. But as I saw this uh, restoration go on, for the next few years, I visited Didi Adici as uh, I took a course, two-day course at UCLA in the year 2000. I wanted to see if he had figured out this uh, deep margin uh, situation. Uh, he had, but he had not figured out the hierarchy of bondability and the decoupling of time. But still, we talked about deep margin elevation. He says, yeah, I just published a paper. It's coming out uh, this year. And that paper uh, will show that for the first time. And this was the paper. And it's a paper that the title had nothing to do with deep margin elevation. It says, Current Clinical Concepts for Adhesive Cementation of Tooth-Colored Posterior Restorations. It's the first time that heated composite is used to seat these uh, inlays and onlays. But in that article, there was a very small illustration. And this small illustration had immediate dent and sealing and a deep margin elevation, not a very deep one, but it was definitely a situation where the bio base is created. Of course, bio base it was, wasn't named till 2003. It's now in Manye Belser's book. But uh, Wendell Robertson came up with the bio base term. I have popularized it. But that paper in 98 was part of Dietschy's investigation that he uh, was carrying on. And eventually he got a PhD dissertation, and that dissertation publication contained two articles that had been published in a kind of an obscure journal for Americans, European Journal of Oral Sciences. But that these two papers gave the information that the composite should be used for this deep margin elevation. Composite had characteristics that were more tooth-like. Didn't use the term biomedic, but that's what he meant. And then as the years went on, I uh, came to, in 2005, to visit Pascal Magne to see what he knew and see what he was doing and what his plans were to teach, because I'd been teaching the six lessons for two years. And the first case that I showed him was that the deep margin elevation that I did in 1998. So this is 
at USC in 2005. This restoration is now seven years old. And I showed it to Pascal and he said, nobody's published that yet. And I said, I know I've been looking at literature and talk with Dietschy. He hasn't published a case, but he had an illustration. He said it was going to be in the new PPAD article. And at 2005, then I did have access to that uh, article. But anyway, the idea was that uh, in Geneva, they were doing this. I had been doing this. My office, 1998, was the year that uh, we both figured this out independently. We fast forward as we keep practicing dentistry and doing dentistry, and I'm teaching dentistry now to dentists, practicing dentists in 2003, and the PhD dissertation from DC is published. I get a copy of it from Pascal. He had a copy in his office. I borrowed it and made a copy. I uh, actually made three copies, gave one to Simone Della Perry, and that PhD dissertation is an outstanding piece of work. I thank DC for it this last year when I spoke with him. Davey and I were on the same stage uh, in the same conference in uh, Chile. But, uh, you know, working these concepts out until it becomes taught and then practiced and then m monitored long term, that's a more difficult thing to do. Uh, the first uh, paper published by Pascal Magne and Berto Sprefico, he actually said that this deep margin elevation was a paradigm shift. Obviously, um, it's something that, you know, bonding a restoration to a composite base, people that don't know composite chemistry and don't know the, uh, the difficulties of it uh, are very afraid to do that. But to those of us who became masters of adhesive dentistry early on, we understood that this had the ability to connect with the two side to side, front to back and top to bottom in that 30 plus megapascal range. And this has been proven. That's science. But then to get enough people to do it and follow it, there's two important papers uh, that were published, uh, one out of Germany. And the title was Proximal Box Elevation with Resin Composite and the Dogma of Biologic Width. Clinical R2 Technique and Critical Review. They called it the R2 Technique. They should have called it the Deep Margin Elevation two years before. Manu and Spray Fico were the first ones to put that term into uh, publication. Uh, there had been a, a USC manual in 2006 that included that. Uh, but, you know, that's kind of splitting hairs. But the Germans, what they wanted to investigate is why these subgingival composites were not bleeding. Because the myth or the dogma of biologic width violation that every periodontist and prosthodontist working con in conjunction felt like it was a reaction of the tissue to the crown material, where in reality it was a reaction to the biofilm underneath the crowns that were not bonded and did not stop this gap formation underneath crowns and fillings. So, inflammation subgingival of an amalgam or inflammation subgingival of a composite, or in inflammation subgingival of a crown, is actually related not to the material, but to the bacteria that are underneath the crown or the filling. And so that's what causes the, the inflammation. If you stay bonded in these deep margin elevations, then that inflammation goes away. This paper by Bresser and Jardol, Heikant, Powell, Kuhn, and Marco Gresnik, my good friend at Groningen University in Holland. That paper showed 95% no inflammation on any of these deep margin elevations. Some of these have been followed 12 years, published in 2019. And so my cases are more than 20 years old and the same situation. is They stay bonded. There's no inflammation. There's no biofilm underneath the crown or the restoration. And so the biologic reaction, the inflammatory reaction of the gingiva to these bacteria is what's called what causes this inflammation and often, often associated with bleeding as the inflammation is into the connective tissue portion of the uh, gingival attachment. Wow. So that's how deep margin elevations got going. And they're possible with composite. They're not possible long-term with 
resin modified glass ionomers and glass ionomers. It's a little discouraging when I hear training at some of the top dental schools where they're actually still doing deep margin elevation with glass ionomer. That's also called an open sandwich technique. That technique was thoroughly debunked in the late 80s because the glass ionomers were brittle. Under functional stresses, they would break down in the years four to six. There are no 20-year deep margin elevations using glass ionomer <laughs> the successful cases, but it's still being taught in a couple of dental schools that I wish it wasn't being taught at. It'll be good for four or five years, but then you have to redo it because it breaks down underneath your composite onlay inlay restoration. And that comes from solid science, the PhD work of D.D. Adichie. Consider him one of my early mentors, of course. Ray Bertolotti, Gary Unterbrink, D.D. Adichie. I was uh, very impressed with everything that he was doing as far as minimally invasive and adhesive dentistry. Of course, aesthetically, just totally beautiful. And after the course, uh, it was actually under the direction of Ed McLaren at UCLA. He was teaching a cosmetic dentistry master course at UCLA at that time. But uh, Dietschy and Ed McLaren and I were talking. I said, Dietschy, I said, I think you're the best dentist in the world, but who do you think is the best dentist? And he, without hardly even thinking, said, Urs Belser. Of course, I hadn't heard his name. I had read it, but not remembered it. He wrote part of the introduction to Dietschy's book. And Urs Belser was the mentor of D.D.A. Dietschy and the mentor of Pascal Magne. And Belser was, is a prosthodontist who mastered all areas of prosthodontics and all areas of implant dentistry associated with prosthodontics. And Belser is the top researcher, teacher, administrator, just a great human being from all reports. I haven't met him personally. But Belser basically told Dietschy, if adhesive dentistry lives up to its potential, it will eliminate most of the endo. It will eliminate most of the perio. It will eliminate prosthodontic destruction of tooth structure. And so all of the specialty disciplines, including implants, will be majorly impacted by implementing adhesive dentistry. Now, if you're a specialist, you might not like to hear that message. I know when I told Steve Buchanan about the six lessons 21 years ago, we had lunch. I said, Steve, this is going to prevent a lot of endo. And he looked at it and says, great. He's very busy in Santa Barbara, still is. He's still uh, teaching and practicing, I believe, in Santa Barbara. But he changed the world of endodontics. The world of periodontics has changed. Unfortunately, it's mostly based on extracting teeth that could be saved with uh, uh, periodontal treatments and good restorative treatments like biomimetic dentistry. But these uh, evolutions, Belser was for. He felt like it was progress as long as we're conserving tooth structure and conserving pulp tissue. Belser understood the difference between a vital and a non-vital tooth. And all of the investigations since the early 2000s have reinforced the idea that a brittleness comes from endodontic treatment that cannot be remedied. A tooth that has endodontic treatment has three times the potential to fracture because it's three times as brittle and it's only a third of the engineering term is toughness. So a tough tooth or a tough material flexes, a brittle tooth or brittle material begins to fracture through crack initiation, crack propagation, and finally catastrophic failure. Anyway, it's a lot to think about, but uh, here we are. Change the world. Till next time, get bonded, stay bonded. <laughs>